I brought with me a companion, a leaf, a southern magnolia leaf, plucked against its will, most likely, from the uh, War Memorial Plaza here as I arrived in Nashville this morning. We pin this name on the leaf, magnolia, and believe that we have in some way captured part of its essence, part of some of its being, southern magnolia. This is the idea, this individualistic idea, an idea that's dominated biology for a couple of hundred years, that the fundamental unit of life is the individual, the species, the individual tree. After all, trees seem to be such wonderful examples of individuality, standing there with their stout trunks alone. The individual gene. And look at me, I seem to be an individual here. There was one name up on the screen here. I'm standing here apparently alone, apart from my small uh, de-leafed companion, on the symbol of, of individuality, the, s the singular red dot of the TED stage. And yet, let's do a little experiment. We'll take our leaf, we'll dip it into bleach, dip it into a little alcohol, then back into the bleach, just to wash off any fungi that might have been on the surface of the leaf. It's been sterilized. And then I'm going to chop the leaf into some little pieces. Sorry, leaf. And put these pieces on a Petri dish. This is a little dish in which we've put some, some media that will encourage the growth of fungi. So any fungi that is hidden inside the leaf, remember, we've sterilized the outside. Anything on the inside will now be revealed. We take our Petri dish and we return in a few days. And what we find is the moldy fridge from hell seems to have appeared. And and on this stage, it's particularly terrifying because it's so large. In reality, these sit on, on, the, on the palm of one's hand. So, the leaf was not alone. It, in fact, had all these dozens of different species of fungi living within it. If we'd sequenced the DNA of the bacteria within the leaf, we'd have found there were also hundreds of species of bacteria living inside the leaf. So the leaf's individuality, the tree's individuality, is in fact an illusion. And now, these fungi are not mere hitchhikers. They're not just inconsequential hangers-on. They're essential to the function of the leaf. Take them away, and the leaf can't protect itself from pathogens. It can't resist drought very well. The same is true for other parts of the plant. If you look down in the roots and look at a single root hair, burrowing its way out into the soil, that root hair is actually made of a series of conversations between plant cells and fungal cells and bacterial cells that allow the root to perform its function, to find minerals, to gather water, to gather information from the soil. If those bonds, if those relationships are broken, the root withers and dies. So instead of the individual being the fundamental unit of biology, we're now learning from genetics and physiology and microbiology that, in fact, the fundamental unit of biology is relationship, is interconnection. Now, that's true for me as well here. I, even though you can't see them, the unaided human senses, of course, can't perceive the bacteria that are in and on my body, and yet without them, my physiology would break down. I would not develop properly. I couldn't live in this world without my bacterial companions. And you cannot see them, but my teachers and friends and family are all present through the tens of thousands of conversations that have found their way into my mind, into my nervous system. So my words appear to be coming from the mouth of one individual. In fact, they're a product of a whole network of relationships. And you can't see these either, but you, the, the relationships I've had with birds and living rivers and forests over many decades now are also part of what is standing here on the stage. So a, a small interior design suggestion, perhaps, midway through the talk, is the color of the carpet. How about a Petri dish carpet with all those glorious colors interconnecting out to symbolize the fact that although the speakers stand here seemingly as individuals, that is an illusion. We are, in fact, living communities. 
You can't see them off stage, but there are hundreds of people here who've made this event possible as well. Let's represent them here too on the carpet. Now, so far I've talked about people and trees as if they were two different examples. Two examples, each illustrative of the other. But in fact, they're not. The two are part of the same story. And let me use one example to make some of these uh, claims manifest and concrete. Here is one street tree on a corner in Manhattan, a very ordinary street tree, a calorie pear. It lives at the corner of 86th Street and Broadway, if you want to go visit with the tree and say hello for me. This is one of the dozen or so trees that I've been visiting and studying for many years, writing about, trying to understand how people and trees are interconnected in different parts of the world. This tree's life is deeply connected to the lives of people who live in that same neighborhood. And this seems a little paradoxical. We think of cities, particularly a big city like Manhattan, as being a place where you're not going to find too many natural ecological interconnections. But in fact, they're there. So what do I mean by this? How so? Well, here's a swipe of a sponge across, excuse me, a swipe of a sponge across a windowsill from inside the apartment a few blocks north of where this tree stands. And what we see on the sponge is all sorts of remnants of soot. These are the particles of pollution that have come from diesel engines and from the boilers of heating systems within apartment buildings that haze the air of any city and then land on windowsills and are inhaled into our lungs, producing ill health in people, but also are connected to trees. And here's what the trees do. They absorb those particles into their leaves and sequester them, and the leaves drop to the ground, removing those particles from the air. Even in the middle of winter, when the tree has no leaves on it, that beautiful three-dimensional structure of twigs and the, and the lovely texture of the bark absorbs and adheres a lot of this particulate air pollution and holds it onto the tree. And then when it rains, the tree, that great sponge of the skies, if you like, washes all that particulate pollution down to the ground. And this is what it looks like when I rest my hand on the bark of that tree during a rain. I pull it away, and the slurry, the dark slurry on my hand, this isn't lichen, this is soot. This is, these are all particles that would have been in my lungs or in the lungs of neighbors in this, in this particular part of the city. And so the trees are connected to the interior of our bodies, connected to us in the most intimate way possible at the cellular level. The other thing that happens when it rains is that the tree gathers all that water onto its body, washes some of it to the ground, to the soil, instead of it running off into the gutter. It slows the flow of stormwater into the drains. That seems like a rather inconsequential thing. But that flow, in fact, is what, causes, is what causes sewage systems to become overwhelmed. And so by slowing the flow of stormwater, trees on city streets reduce the amount of raw sewage that flows into rivers, increases the health of people and other members of life's community downstream. So trees are connected to us through the rain. What else does a city street a tree on a city street do? Well, let's do another experiment. Let's take a thermometer, place it on the ground, underneath the canopy of the tree in the middle of summer, and then place another thermometer on the unshaded sidewalk just a few feet away. And we'll find that the temperature on the sidewalk is 20 degrees warmer here than it is under the tree. We come back at night, maybe at 2 a.m., place our thermometers on the ground again, and we find there's still a difference of maybe 10, 15 degrees. Why is that? Because all that sunlight soaked into the ground and then the asphalt, the concrete, and then is re-emitted at night, warming the city. The interior of the city is sometimes 7, 10 degrees warmer than the countryside around. And so city trees cool the fevered brow of the city increasing quality of, light, of, of life for people who live in the city, but also meaning that we don't have to pay for the air conditioning costs that, that, that we would have paid otherwise if the trees had not been there cooling the city down for us. 
in New York City, where this particular tree is located, that amounts to $10 million a year in saved air conditioning costs because of the presence of trees on the sidewalk. Trees also find their way into our lives through social networks. Imagine being on a sidewalk in New York where there are no trees. If you've been to the city, you know very well what the rules of human movement are. Keep moving or you will be mowed down without a word of apology. The, it's like running the river rapids. There is one motion, motion possible, and that is forward motion at the, at the rate at which everyone else is moving. You can't stop and chat or, or check your phone or read a newspaper. But if you plant city trees along the edge of the sidewalk, those trees create pools and eddies into which people can move, take that call on the phone, talk a little to their neighbors, catch up on the news or have a snack. So trees on city streets diversify the possibilities for human interaction. And you can do this experiment for yourself. Just watch any of the city trees here or elsewhere, and you'll see how they change how people interact on the street. There's a sensory component to this as well, because standing under the canopy of the tree, the light is a little different. The green, a tinge in, in, the, in the summer that we find pleasant. The taste of the air has some of those beautiful plant aromas in it. The sound is a little brighter because every leaf is a little sound reflector that reflects down the high wavelengths back to the street while letting the low wavelengths, the longer wavelengths, run away. And so the trees gather us together. And I think our, our cultural symbols, our religious symbols, recognize this. At the center of almost every religious tradition is a tree a tree of enlightenment, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, even a, Christ, even a Christmas tree in, in more secular mode. These trees are representatives of life and interconnection. Now, the examples that I've given you so far are examples of how we benefit from trees. Of course, trees also benefit from our presence in the, in the city. Human hands plant them. But it's not just the process of planting that is important. It's the process of care. A tree that is planted by an anonymous municipal worker and then left alone on a city street has about a 60% chance of still being alive after 10 years. If instead that tree is planted with help from people in the neighborhood and it has a little tag on it that says, hi, I'm your new tree, I'd appreciate it if you didn't chain your bike to me, bring me a little water if it's a dry summer, don't let your dog poop here, please. That tree probability of survival goes up to nearly 100%. So by raising trees in human awareness, bringing them into consciousness, including them in the social network of the neighborhood, we give them life, literally. Now, we're connected then on a city corner at a cellular level, at the level of social networks, at the level of the physiology of the whole city, humans and trees interconnected. Every single example I gave you that was true for one tree in Manhattan is also true for the relationship between people and forests across the world. Trees produce the rain, they clean the rivers, they store carbon, they harbor biodiversity, they encourage productive human interactions. These are true across the world, and they take different forms, of course, in, in different countries, whether it's the olive trees of the Middle East, the sabo trees of the Amazon, or the balsam firs of the boreal forest. All of these trees are social mediators in many ways. And unfortunately, forests are not doing so well. Our relationships with trees are not faring well under our care as we become a dominant species on this planet. In the first dozen years of this millennium, the world lost 2.3 million square kilometers of forest, but only 800,000 regrew. So we lost 2.3, and we gained only 0.8. That's an appalling balance sheet. We're on a very improvident path for a species whose life is so tightly tied up with trees. So, so we face a choice. Either we can return to our leaf and listen to the, to the lesson of the leaf and indeed the lesson of our own bodies. 
And that lesson is that we gain life through interconnection, through relationship, through reciprocity. We can listen to that path and try to live into it, or we can do what no other species has yet been able to do on this planet, and that is to try to go it alone. I'd suggest, of course, that the path of interconnection is the more productive and likely more successful path for us. And so I close with an invitation. And that invitation is to find a tree. And over the next six months, go and visit that tree with nothing but an enthusiastic openness of your senses and an active curiosity. And to ask of that tree and ask of that place, what is the relationship in this place? What are the networks of interconnections that are present here? What is my place in those? What is the place of this tree? And then find a way to reciprocate, to ask what is a way to be the most productive uh, other partner in this set of interconnections that give us all life. Thank you.